Hi everyone. So in this last video on uh, this topic, the different topics that we talked about, we're gonna concentrate on Dalton's atomic theory, um, and it was all you know deriving from the laws that we talked about in the previous several videos. Okay. So let's start with um, Dalton first before we uh, went on to the atomic theory. Uh, Dalton was the first person also to propose masses remember that we talked about the idea that you know once people realize the importance of conservation of mass which is the fact that mass doesn't change in a chemical reaction and then in the previous remember that in the previous um, video we talked about this idea of law of multiple proportion and knowing that if we're able to know the formula of one of the compounds we can then determine using the law of multiple proportion what is the chemical formula of the other compounds Dalton then proposed that um, uh, certain atomic weights for each of these elements that were known at the time of his uh, when he was alive um, and using that he was then starting to make uh, certain uh, you know uh, assumptions about um, formulas of chemicals around you know that were known at the time water and other chemicals copper oxide and so on okay so he was able to do this um, and not only that he he was also um, had other contributions, just like Lavoisier had uh, many contributions to chemistry. He was uh, the first person to uh, propose a reason for color blindness because he himself is colorblind. This is now called Daltonism in his honor. He, uh, as I just showed in the previous uh, slide, <clears throat> proposed the first table of atomic weights. Uh, and we're not really going to learn this till the next chapter, but you know, he was the first person to kind of decided that, okay, maybe we should assign some weights to this thing so then we can get chemical formulas from them. Um, he also, uh, as you'll see later on in a couple of chapters later, had important contributions uh, um, in the development of theories of gases uh, in terms of partial pressures and temperatures. And, and this is something called Dalton's Law, which we'll see when we talk about gases. Uh, he gave some names to the elements, English names specifically, because before that it was all Latin names. And then, uh, of course, the important contribution was the atomic theory, which we're going to get into now. So Dalton's atomic theory developed in 1800s, um, basically kind of went back to this idea that was originally proposed by Democritus, right, way back when, um, in ancient uh, Greece, that matter is really... Uh, something that is composed of a piece, a, small, a smallest piece that you can't divide anymore, okay? Now, Dalton is a little bit more specific than uh, Democritus in terms of its development of atomic theory. What he said is that all matter consists eventually of these indivisible particles called atoms, okay? So if you take a, a sample of matter, you keep cutting it down, eventually you're going to get to a point where you can't cannot cut anymore okay and that is what we refer to as one atom okay uh, so that's you know just think about uh, uh, beads for example necklace make out of made out of beads right uh, you can break it down eventually after you get to one beat you can no longer break it down and that's uh, your atom okay so the couple of additional um, concepts related uh, the atomic theory. First off, all the atoms of a given element have identical mass and properties. Okay. Another way of saying this is an example of this would be like if we're talking about atoms of oxygen, we would say that all atoms of oxygen are exactly identical in terms of its mass and its properties. Okay, its chemical and physical properties. Now, um, at that time, that was thought to be true, but we later found out that you can actually have atoms of oxygens that have different masses. This is what we call isotopes, which we'll learn a little bit later in this chapter. Uh, but the idea was actually quite correct, you know, that if you, you know, if you have atoms of oxygens, they have similar properties in the sense that they have similar reactivity, they have similar physical properties, and so on. Um, and as a result of this, a corollary to this is that the atoms of different elements have different properties and different masses, right? So in other words, if all atoms of oxygen are the same, but atoms of carbon and atoms of oxygen would have different mass 
uh, with respect to each other and different properties as well. Okay, this is really what's um, something that's really re revolutionary in terms of the atomic theory because what he's saying is that if you have something that's made out of carbon versus something that's made out of oxygen, they're going to have different properties, and the properties uh, come came you know come out because of the fact that these um, carbons and oxygen atoms have different masses. And la uh, a couple of additional points is a compound is a specific combination of whole number of atoms of more than one element. Okay, so for example, let's say you have two compounds A and B and they're both composed of carbon and oxygen. So compound A might have one carbon and one oxygen, compound B might have one carbon and two oxygen. Okay. This is only uh, possible to kind of, un you know, possible to conclude this based on that law of multiple proportion. Because if you remember back to law of multiple proportion, what we found out earlier with law of multiple proportion is that we found out that, you know, when we have a compound, right, two, three different compounds in this case, one of the compounds uh, has a whole number multiple uh, of this an element compared to the other compound. Like in this case, A has four times the number of nitrogen compared to C. Now, the only thing, the only way this is possible is if there's like a unit of atom, okay? Like one size that's finite size. And so this thing can have four times that size. So if you're talking about essences like Aristotle, there's no way you can have something that's four times the number of essences because those things are continuous. There's no way to divide them. Okay, so sort of like talking about water. There's there's no smallest amount of water, right? Water can be a lot or a little bit, but there isn't like a size of water. But if you're talking about marbles, you know, there's clearly one smallest piece of marble. So something could have four times as many marbles as the other one, uh, but it's not possible so much to talk about water. Uh, you know, in that sense, okay, so like, you know, this is as analogy to, to the difference between these two theories of for es the essence theory versus the atomic theory, okay. Um, now, the last part is due to conservation of mass, because masses don't change as a result of a chemical reaction, the conclusion there is that atoms, because the masses come up because you have those atoms, right? Let's say you have a certain mass. The mass is a result of having a certain type of atoms and a certain number of atoms. If the masses don't change, you must have concluded that the atoms are not changed either. So in other words, you have the same atoms on uh, before reaction and after reaction. So the atoms are neither created nor destroyed. The only thing that happens is that they're changing partners to produce different substances. So remember at the very early on when we talk about conservation of mass, we say that, well, you got something that looks like this, and now you have something that looks like that. Very different, right? But the atoms that make up these two substances and the atoms that make up this substance is exactly the same atoms, except that now they've changed the way they're connected to each other and this is we're going to get into the topic of chemical bonds a little bit later in this chapter just an introduction to it but basically the chemical bonds are changing so as a result you don't get the same look anymore this thing looks very different than that okay okay so let's uh talk a little a little bit about you know the idea of theory and laws again relating to each other right so in the, the previous chapter we talked about the scientific method we talk about theory and we talk about laws now a theory, as I mentioned before, is something that's very strong in, in science, okay? A theory is uh, basically a, a hypothesis that's been tested many, many times over, and it's a, it's a kind of a whole model of how something works. In this case, it's how matter works, really, right? A matter is composed of atoms. So um, I just want to show here how strong this atomic theory is because it's basically backed up or supported by all of the three different you know the three different laws that we talked about which is conservation of mass definite proportion or multiple proportion all of these laws um, support the different statements in the atomic theory and that's the way it should be if uh, you're developing a theory in science okay okay so in the last part here briefly I just want to describe how chemical formula was originally determined after Dalton's uh, atomic theory. So the person who did this experiment was somebody called uh, Joseph uh, Gay-Lussac uh, 
and we're gonna see him again and also this guy here Avogadro uh, when we talk about gases and I want to uh, mention this experiment again at that point but basically what he did was that he found that when he reacted certain gases like hydrogen and chlorine for example he was able to obtain a product hydrogen chloride all of these are gases now what he noticed is that the way the reaction happens there's a volume ratio between the reactants and the product or the stuff that's here and the stuff that's here so what he found for example with the hydrogen chlorine and hydrogen chloride reaction he found that every time he made the product there's always you always need one volume of hydrogen and one volume of chlorine and it's always giving you two volumes of hydrogen chloride so in other words let's say if I have one liter of uh, hydrogen then I'm gonna need one liter of chlorine to react with it and then I'm gonna produce twice the amount two volumes of it which is two liters of hydrogen chloride now how is that useful how can that be used to um, determine formulas well think about it let's say you assume that the formula for hydrogen is H okay so as I write here we assume the volume of hydrogen is I mean the formula for hydrogen is H I didn't know remember they didn't know at the time and let's say I assume the formula for chlorine gas is just Cl okay and of course that's my simplest assumption I just assume that there is just only one atom of hydrogen making hydrogen gas now if I were to add these two things together as you can see and I assume hydrogen chloride has a formula of HCl then of course based on conservation of mass right because I only have one hydrogen atom and I only have one chlorine atom I should only get one uh, HCl gas okay but notice that if I assume this formula that doesn't match up with my experimental observation my experimental observation is one hydrogen and one chlorine give me two hydrogen chloride so then I, I have to assume that something is wrong in these formulas that I'm writing but what happens if I write this as my formula if I write this as my formula immediately I see that when I if I my hydrogen chloride has this formula then that gives me the correct relationship which is one volume of this and one volume of this giving two volumes of that okay so that's how people started to determine that hydrogen has this formula and chlorine has this formula and hydrogen chloride has that formula okay so this is the beginning of formula chemical formula determination now we will talk about uh, Avogadro later but Avogadro was actually the person who interpreted that he said that the volume is basically the same as the number of particles that you have here uh, so volume is somehow related to a number of particles now we'll talk more about Avogadro uh, in the next chapter and then in the gases chapter as well okay just very quickly I want to end this video here uh, by talking about a little bit of the historical timeline starting from Democritus way back when talking about the atomic theory all the way to Gay-Lussac and Avogadro where we just finished talking about how gases combine in specific volume and thereby giving us formulas for these gases okay